Hello everybody, I'm Jesus Heredia Carroza. Oh, I'm a uh, cultural economics researcher from Universidad de Sevilla. And we are here today to speak about cultural policies in, in Europe and new European movement of music, okay? We have three very good panelists. We have Katerina Weiner. She's policy advisor to the European Music Council. She studied political science, history, and literature. She worked in the Creative Europe desk in Germany. And nowadays, uh, she is working in uh, like a cultural policy association and Europe for Citizen Point, okay? Also, we have Isabel, Isabel Perez. She is a technician at the cultural office of the Creative Europe desk in Spain, Ministry of Culture and Sport. The Creative Desk Europe Desk Spain is the gateway for Spanish cultural operators to the Creative Europe program. It promotes European initiative in the field of culture and audiovisual and facilitates participation in the program. Okay? And finally, we have, uh, like panelist, uh, Frank uh, Kimene, cultural professional specialist in performing arts. He combines his musical skills with managerial one, because he was a punk musician and nowadays is music promoter in all. Frank uh, has worked as consultant in the organization such, uh, such as the Dutch Performing Art Fund, the Red Bull Culture, and the Dutch Consulate in the, in the United States of America. Dealing with issues, uh, issues such as financing, trade mission, and music internalization, okay? And now I would like to start uh, speaking about music movement in Europe. In Europe, um, please, Katerina. Um, about music most Europe. Yes. Um, okay. I, so uh, a few years ago, um, several organizations from the music sector in Europe um, approached the European Commission to make the case we need more specific funding for music. There's a culture program, which I'm sure Isabel and Frank will, will talk about later, and, but there's a specific fo program, for example, for the film industry, but there's nothing comparable for music. And in 2015, um, there were conversations with the European Com Commission started about creating um, an extra funding for music um, from, from the European Union. Um, and um, after some time, and actually for, uh, on, on a European level comparatively, this, this was a rather quick success, that after some setbacks um, and at the beginning of this year, there were some specific calls for proposals launched for specific funding for music. Um, but I think it's very important to understand that this whole movement, which is now called Music Most Europe, it's not only about funding programs, but it's also about um, creating a dialogue between the music sector and the uh, policymakers on European levels about what are the, some of the challenges and obstacles of the music sector in Europe, especially since it has changed so much um, over the last years. And um, what are some of the policies that could be introduced also on European level that could help and where's more cooperation needed. And um, yeah, there, there were some first sm very small programs about training and capacity building, um, distribution, um, a feasibility study about a music observatory, which are um, either starting right now or are still being selected. Um, but that's, that's kind of the first step. But really it came out of a desire from the music sector. We need to do something specific for music on the EU level. Um, well, the good news is, um, um, without maybe getting into too much of the details of how um, such a special funding can work, um, this is, goes all under the line of a pilot action, um, some extra money that comes from the European Parliament, um, which was granted this year, and um, they have extended it now to, um, to next year as well. So there will be some new calls um, early next year. 
Um, we don't know yet exactly what they will be on, but um, what we have heard is that for the call, for example, on training capacity building, there were a lot of requests for it. So maybe there will be something else on this too. And at the same time, on EU level, um, the st discussions aren't going about the future of the funding program starting in 2021, um, going lasting until 2027. And there, at the moment, the proposal is to include a special line for music in the culture program. So we have come really, in a comparatively short time, have really come really far um, in, regarding special funding for music on EU level at the moment. Thank you, Caterina. Mm -hmm. Frank, I would like to know what is your opinion about the, the opportunities that young people have with these kind of events? Uh, who, which people? Uh, what opportunities are, very, are interesting for young people? For young people? Yes. Um, for young people or for artists, uh, maybe, in or in general, or uh, I was kind of wondering what kind of audience we have in the venue to begin with. Who is an artist here? or who runs a, a festival maybe, who works in policy, who uh, is a manager, <laughs> hey, <laughs> four managers, who runs a booking agency. <laughs> okay, I saw one, two familiar faces there. So who has experience here with uh, like funding in general? And, and what, are you Spanish or? Uh, what kind of funding uh, do you receive? Okay, and and what did they get funded for? Like for uh, tours or for? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. To beyond. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. That's really interesting <laughs> because. Um, I, I come from the music industry. I have 15 years of music industry experience and I'm taking my first steps in the European uh, dimension at the moment, which is really uh, weird and uh, sometimes really uh, abstract and difficult to understand. But I always try to make uh, a translation like, hey, what does this whole um, Music Moves Europe uh, potential, potentially mean for people like you, you know? Uh, like, what's in it for the artists? What's in it for the bookers, for the managers, for the, for the festivals? Because uh, it's a great initiative, uh, as uh, Katarina was uh, trying to uh, explain. Uh, like, it's really special that the European Commission has decided to, in such a, such a fast way, relatively speaking, uh, decided to... Uh, <laughs> to start funding uh, music because uh, they normally don't fund like a sector specifically uh, that well. So that's a good thing, but what does it mean? And um, that's what we're trying to figure out at the moment as well because uh, there is, as Katrina was explaining, there's like some, um, some pilot studies going on, but there's a really big things like a European music observatory, you know? It's about uh, trying to collect uh, data about the European music sector, but that's not what you, on the work floor, uh, you know, that's not something that you uh, benefit, yeah, you benefited from it indirectly. Um, I think Music Moves Europe will also in eventually start uh, being way more directly relevant for, um, uh, for people like artist managers and booking agents, but this, this will take a little bit of more time because the, 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 the initiative is, you know, in a pilot phase and uh, for example next year there's going to be uh, some st uh, structured dialogues with the sector as they call it so uh, the European Commission and the agency and correct me if I'm wrong here but uh, are going to um, have a dialogue a, a conversation with people on the work floor like with people that work with artists that that support uh, work as a booking agent or as a manager or as a festival and see like hey what are your needs and I think there's a great potential there for, um, for everybody who's working in the field to, to voice their opinion about what, what is it what, you, what we need the funding for, you know, what on a really direct level. And um, to come back to your question, um, I think one of the more interesting things there is um, that the Europe so far only funds uh, organizations and institutes, and they are main, 
they are thinking about maybe also going to fund directly on an individual level uh, artists, uh, maybe for mobility, so that mobility is a, an expensive word for touring uh, in a European uh, uh, context. But um, so who knows? Uh, this might lead up to uh, 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 some possibilities of direct funding on an artist level to do like some European uh, uh, touring or that kind of stuff. So that's that's what we are now trying to figure out. If I can maybe um, add to what uh, Frank has just explained. I mean, um, of course there is um, a big distance between, if you look at the European Commission, the European Parliament, and what most of you do on the ground, working with artists and working in venues and festivals and so on. And for to, to get that message across, you always need um, mediators in between. Um, and these kind of organizations that function as mediators are um, really, they are trying to get a message across. That's what we are trying as, I work at the European Music Council, we are a non-governmental organization. We're a civil society organization, we have member organizations, European Music Councils, but also in, in a European organization that whose members are venues and festivals, um, but also not from the education side and so on and so on. So that's our connection to the sector. And we constantly um, talk to um, people who do all these jobs in the music sector, trying to figure out what's going on, what's, wor what's working at the moment, what's not working at the moment, what is needed, um, especially <coughs> for those that want to work on the international level. And that's what we are trying to, to put into policy needs and talking to the European Commission about. And then trying to make those into policies that hopefully provide a better frame, a better basis and background for you to do your job. And, and I think with Music Moose Europe, we've, we've come one step further, but of course there's still a long way to go, but I think um, the, the door is open at the moment, and that's really good. But it's always important to, to have those conversations and, and trying to figure out what, what is really, what are your challenges, obstacles at the moment, what do you think would uh, make your work a lot easier? Okay. Isabel, um, I would like to know what are the, the needs for musicians in Spain? In Spain? <laughs> yes, concretely in Spain. Well, I think it's a general, they are, general needs in our Europe, I think. But um, if I may talk a little bit more about what my colleague uh, said, uh, these policies, Music with Europe and the new agenda, the European Agenda for Music, um, they are there to respond some challenges. And I would like to know if you are agree with the challenges that have been identified. I guess that maybe yes, maybe not, but I would like to share that with you. So one of them is technological change. Another one is digitalization and online distribution. Issue for artists and performers from smaller European countries. Fragmented music ecosystem and underfinancing of the sector. I don't know if you visualize these challenges as the challenges that you are facing, but uh, it's, that's we are trying from the European Commission this program's focus on music to, to, to respond. And what, uh, looking at these challenges from Creative Europe and the sub-program of culture that is the one where music is into, uh, offers some funding opportunities and some tools to try to uh, accommodate these needs. And above all, they are focused on mobility of artists and music professionals. They are setting of funding to cover these, these needs and the mobility as well of uh, artists and, uh, well, actually Ines is, 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 uh, is part of, of this program. Uh, it has been funded by Creative Europe Culture and there are eight festivals, uh, 12 festivals now involved. And what they are addressing is these issues, mobility uh, for artists, but as well for professionals. That's why they have Ines Talents, that's why they have Ines Festivals, Ines Pro, Ines Conference. So 
the, that's the, the direct outcome of exactly yeah that. so just to visualize uh, and in related to your question actually I think that the, the needs are the, the, the same, the same. Um, that's why this kind of policy are so important no? because we try to f to fight these challenges from a cross-border point of view, for example. So, uh, sorry. <laughs> Isabel, could you speak uh, a little bit more about the fragmented music ecosystem? Fragmented? Well, actually, uh, that's the, the lack of connection sometimes between the different agents in the sector. No, that's what I understand for this. Maybe my colleagues, uh, but it's above all that there is a lack of uh, connections, and that's why one of the, the um, challenges that this program addresses as well is the, this need of networking, what we are doing today here, yes. no? That's the, we need to be in touch with the music sector of Poland, of UK, Netherlands, Germany, because it's the way to face this all together, and as well to push for more uh, funding uh, for this sector. But maybe they have more details yes, about. Yeah. <laughs> Could you speak a little bit more about this question, please? About uh, fragmented uh, yes, ecosystem. I'm very interested in this question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's actually. I think uh, we can take uh, hours to uh, answer this question because, uh, well, <clears throat> we're all European here, I guess, right? Uh, so uh, Europe is a fragmented continent. I mean, we uh, we exist uh, out of what is it? The Euro zone is like 26 or 27 countries at the moment with uh, just as much uh, language barriers and, um, and tax laws and all that kind of stuff. And um, Europe, the, like the big European project has always been to try and create a single market. And um, this is part of that, uh, to try and make it easier for everybody to cross borders, to connect to your counterparts in another country. And, um, that can either be through mobility, but it can also be, I think, uh, a bit of a related thing is a big breakthrough was the, the copyright reform yes. that has been going on, uh, which was passed a couple of, no, not passed, uh, but the first, it took the first, the first step, let's put it that way, um, a couple of uh, months ago. It's also uh, Europe trying to create a single uh, clear market for uh, everybody who is making, making some music or, or other ways of forms of art here in Europe. And um, I think uh, Music Moves Europe really contributes to, to that unification of the European music market and music sector. And that's uh, a good thing because on the other hand, unification doesn't mean uh, that it's uniform. Um, Europe is a, a really fragmented continent and that's also really something that we should cherish because there are so many, there's so much diversity going on in this continent. If you compare it to, for example, the United States or something, um, you know, the, the musical diversity, the language diversity, the history, it's, uh, it's really important that we maintain that, but it's also important that it gets heard. And if you listen to the radio, I don't know how it is here in Spain, but uh, if we listen to the radio in the Netherlands or put on a music channel, you like 80% of the repertoire you hear is basically English or American. And what uh, Europe is trying to do with this program is also to give a bit of a counterweight, counterbalance to that dominance, and you know to show uh, what we have in um, what we have in Europe. And this, you know, it's. Spanish is, of course, a really big language in the, in the world, but from a, coming from a small country like the Netherlands, for example, this is uh, really something I think is worth uh, pursuing. Yeah. Thank you, Frank. Uh, I would like to know if, uh, from Europe, we have any policy for traditional popular music. I, my research field is about uh, popular, traditional popular music in the case of flamenco, salsa in America, or doina in Romania. And I would love to know if Europe do something to improve the situation of this kind of music. Could you speak about uh, this subject, please, Katerina? Um, well, um, the, on, on a European level, there, there is, in, in most cases, it's not a, a genre-specific funding, usually. 
So there is no funding for this is for just for classical music and this is just for jazz and this is just for pop rock. There is nothing like it. Um, theoretically, it's all open um, to, to all genres. Um, but um, it's, it's true, but I mean, you, you two are more closer, I think, to, to a lot of the funded projects. If you look at them, of course, a lot of those projects come from the classic music and come from pop rock and maybe a little bit of jazz and um, um, a little bit of early music. But um, um, so um, there, there is, I think, a lot more um, potential also to do something for, um, to do more in the, in the traditional um, folk music um, Part of the part of the genre, but um, I mean, it is. It's not. It's not that there are any particular barriers put into place, or that it wasn't allowed, or that there weren't any possibilities. It hasn't. Um, the request from the other sectors has been a lot stronger, mm -hmm. and um, but I think what's what's also what's always true. Those um, organizations coming from those sectors have a lot of experience in applying for those funding programs. Um, and if you're coming into something like this very new, of course, it, it, there's a learning curve to it. So there's a lot of um, um, trial and error um, if, you, if you start out. But um, um, it is, I think, in a lot of sense, um, the, the EU funding programs are, um, in, in that sense, more open very often than, than a lot of national or regional local funds. But um, we have to also be realistic. Um, it is still a small funding program. It always sounds like a lot of money that's in these programs, but if you uh, consider that it's um, open to not only the 28 EU countries, but also, which is very good, a lot of the neighboring countries, so um, the way over 30 countries, um, and those programs last for seven years, then if you then count it down to every year and what's available, it's suddenly really small. So there's a lot of competition, that's true. But potentially, um, it is it is open. Or I don't know if, I'm sure there is a project. Yeah, I don't know if you if have, I may. you probably well, have one in mind. You, you know of any? Uh, well, it's because, that's maybe it could be interesting for you because um, for projects related to traditional music, mm -hmm. you can apply for uh, our program, the sub-program sub culture. Uh, in uh, taking in a, into account two priorities. Uh, the first one, of course, is music. It's one of the creative sector. But at the same time, it could be intangible heritage. Yes. And one of the, the main lines, actually, for the current call for proposals for European cooperation projects there are two news for this year, and one of, one of them is uh, to promote uh, intangible heritage, material intangible heritage, and in connections uh, uh, with uh, contemporary creation. So you can, uh, of course, that there is a room for this, but as Katarina say, what they found is not so high, so the, uh, there are a lot of competitors because there are a lot of good projects that they, they are presented. But uh, if you are working on this uh, direction, mm -hmm. for sure there, there is room for, for this kind of projects. Yes, because I'm very worried about uh, the situation of this kind of music. I, I was researching in Colombia. For example, the situation of Colombia or Latin America is very different than Europe. For example, here in Spain with flamenco, we have a study only for flamenco in Sevilla, okay? And the 45, uh, 43 of young people from Sevilla don't listen flamenco. Or when I was in Romania, we make a study about doina, and we have a lot of problems because Romania young people that don't listen doina. Both of them are protected by UNESCO in 2009 and 2010. It, what happened? Yeah, it's just, if I may um, um, make a really practical uh, remark again, um, what you uh, studied, uh, you mm -hmm. know, the, the flamenco, but also the Romanian music, and you see like there's a common problem with yes. uh, that kind of traditional music in European several problem. countries, right? Well, 
then you know the Creative Europe program is actually a pretty <laughs> good uh, way to try and get some funding because the program is also about national uh, collaboration between countries, mm -hmm. and it's a, you have to actually have partners in other countries. So if you find partners that deal with similar problems in other countries, you can try and set up a project together and aim it at uh, you know trying to maybe. Yes. Uh, uh, revive the, the, the traditional music sector or maybe help uh, musicians or professionals that work in the sector uh, to get the word out better, maybe try and uh, create new ways of listening to, um, mm -hmm. you know, traditional music, uh, maybe try to do something with digital uh, uh, distribution of really traditional music and that is exactly where this program um, is meant for, you know, try to help uh, because the music eco ecosystem is fragmented, uh, fragmented also in the artistical way, not only in the managerial way. Mm. So, so I have other questions. But uh, if I just, um, um, and additionally, this is music from underrepresented group of people yes. related to minorities. And this is a good point as well, yes. because uh, it's Roma people is around all Europe. Yeah. Um, and so you have key facts that, that they, it's, they are under the, the, the action lines of, of this program, actually. Hmm. Thank you. I have other question about innovation in music. We are very interested in the managerial side, but I'm interested in the artistical side. There are, uh, or are there some programs that uh, improve the innovation in music or not? Could you speak about that, uh, Isabel, please, or Frank? Isabel? Well, I'm going to do a very short introduction of Creative Europe, the subprogram of culture, because um, actually there are different priorities. Um, one of them is mobility. The other one is uh, audience uh, development. Mm -hmm. The third one is capacity building. So it's related to what you are talking about. And under capacity building, uh, it's uh, really supported the programs that is focused on digitization mm -hmm. and uh, training and education, and as well, new business models. So everything is under this umbrella. And innovation and, and innovative projects is uh, it's uh, one of the war start, the, the war starts, no? <laughs> the, the main words in, in the program, no? to clean creativity, innovation, and capacity building for artists, of course, but as well for promoters, for uh, managers, for all the professionals of, of the sector. So, yeah. But you, you probably mean really the artistic, like the composition and that kind of uh, way, of new ways of composing maybe, or, or do you mean that? Or, um, it's yeah, a bit what Isabella is saying. If you try, you have to connect it to uh, um, uh, one of those priorities of the program. So it's a bit, uh, maybe you have to ha have one step in between. Like if, if you um, compose in a new way or maybe with new ways of composing with international uh, artists or create new ways, then you uh, also create a better position of the artist, which is, uh, increases the capacity of the artist. And then, you know, that's, then you connect it again to one of the priorities of the program. And, mm -hmm. and that way, um, it could be possible to maybe apply for it, but then it has to be part of a bigger project again with international yes. partners. And I'm, I'm very interested in this thing because I was uh, working in Rotterdam with a project of Root and Roots Foundation. Mm. And we were three weeks, for three weeks, only to create something new, mm. to mixture flamenco with jazz or traditional popular music from Poland. And I think that program, that, that kind of program, are very important for the evolution of the art, you know? Yeah. And we are Europe, and I think we can uh, build something or some kind of music in common, like USA, like you said before. But it's very difficult, but I think that we can try with programs. What do you think? Yeah, uh, I just wanted to uh, give you um, an example of a project that um, mm -hmm. 
um, was coordinated by the International Music Council. So, um, and it's it's the Rostrum Plus project. It's a um, connected to the International Rostrum of Composers. So it's a um, the aim of the project in a broader sense is to bring more um, contemporary music into radios and the concert halls and they work with a lot of young composers in this project. The project is coming to an end at the end of this year, I think. So there, there are these um, projects, but like, like Frank and Isabel explained, the, the idea was um, coming from a perspective um, from organizations from several countries looking at, okay, we don't have a lot of contemporary music in radio, in, in the concert halls. Um, um, how can we address this? What successful strategies have been implemented? Maybe are there some others that we can test in project like that? And while at the same time providing training um, for young composers and getting them um, the opportunity to um, to work also in other European countries, and so that's kind of in a in a very um, short um, bullet points kind of the, the the basic idea of the of the project. So, and that you could apply that not only to um, composing or innovation in music, but of course to to several other contents. It's really important for everything on that comes from EU level. The idea of European cooperation and working together in exchanging ideas, learning from each other and really collaborating. That's really the, the focus on, uh, of all of this. Um, and um, yeah, that has to be, always be a, a strong component. Okay, thank you. We were talking about uh, popular music and now uh, traditional popular music and now I want to know about future music. What are the new movement artistical movement in Europe? <laughs> Sound, SoundCloud rap. <laughs> I don't know, uh, Jesus, I, I kind of stepped away a little bit from the music industry to start working in policy, so I don't really know that much about the uh, music uh, sector anymore, but um, maybe, uh, Teun and Bas, you run a booking agency in the Netherlands. What's uh, happening in uh, new in music at the moment? Like, what's our new movements in music? I'm not in this panel. Um, Sorry, man. I owe you a beer. I think things are happening faster. Um, like festivals for next year are being booked earlier in advance, um, which is like I was talking to Boss, a colleague, um, earlier today, and he said it's a shame for the dynamics of the business because smaller bands don't get a chance. Yeah. Well, get less of a chance to, to like actually prove themselves because like the slots are being filled in by the bands, they get all the hype. So it would be good to like have the underground rise a little bit up mm. and get a little bit more attention, perhaps. So like the speeding of, up <coughs> of everything is kind of a really important factor at the moment, right? I mean, if you look at new bands, they get signed really quick or... Uh, yeah. New, new music gets uh, out really quick. People don't work for like for two years on an album anymore, but uh, just throw new music online every day. And so this, I think that that's pretty, I think. It's, it's, it's the whole world because everything is going faster. Information is yeah. accessible more and more. Um, there's no, like the traditional ways are kind of like flowing away. Like everything has to happen now, has to happen fast. You have a showcase event like this, and a lot of the bands already have a booker before they play it. You know, there's something wrong in, in, in that sense also. Yeah. You know, things don't have the time to ripen before, um, like, making their move. You know, they have to do it before they're actually ready to do it sometimes. So I think it's, it's more difficult, but it's also more easy. Mm. <laughs> That's true. There we go. That's a nice paradox to end it. <laughs> okay, so speeding up of the 
of okay. everything <laughs> is one of the things that is really important okay. in music. <laughs> okay, Frank, uh, we are talking about music and now about fans, okay? About fans. Funding, okay. Uh, in your view uh, as promoter, or past promoter, -promoter. Yeah. past promoter, yeah. what is the importance of these fans? <laughs> well, they pay for your tickets, yeah, uh, so, and your records, and your, your streaming, so, uh, but... Uh, and could you speak about a good strategy to use this kind of fans for the small bands? Ah, Jesus. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> what... Jesus, that's a difficult question in this context because it steps a little bit away from uh, maybe the topic of the panel. But um, um, I think the overall in the last uh, five to ten years, the distance between fan and the artist has decreased a lot. And I think that's an interesting movement. Also something we might need to take into account with uh, creating the Music Moves Europe funding program because um, the artist is not that, you know, that uh, uh, semi-god on, uh, on a throne anymore. It's, some, it's a person like you and me. And um, um, there's new, the new ways of communicating with the fans and with the people that listen to your music. That's, that's something uh, that's evolving so fast at the moment that it, it gives great opportunities to create and to reach a lot of potential listeners. Also, uh, for music that might not be heard that easily, so there is a, a, a lot happening there. But um, yeah, I mean, without fans, it's, there's no. Uh, it's impossible no music. to do anything. <laughs> so, no, um, I think that it's very important the the internet way. You know, we mm -hmm. we can use this kind of fans to to make a good strategy, a business strategy with the internet tools. Mm -hmm. What yeah. do you think about uh, that, Katerina? Um, I, mean, I mean, certainly this could also be um, something to be, to be addressed and, and potentially um, um, get funding for, but um, I think getting back a little bit to what I said earlier, how do um, small or up-and-coming bands benefit from, from this program or this funding, I think it's in a more, probably in a more indirect way way. So it's not that a band or a manager sits down and writes an application for this funding, but um, it's about, um, another example is, is maybe Life Europe, um, um, which is funded through the program and it's an, um, a platform of, um, I think, 9, 10, 12, 13, or 14, or th yeah. 13, 14 okay. venues, small venues um, all over Europe. Uh, and they get funding um, so that they um, have concerts of um, um, European non-national um, um, artists, bands, whatever, um, in their venues. So it's it's about also promoting more this the the, um, the fragmentation that we're talking about. This is ex addressing exactly this topic that um, people are not only listening to um, national acts and or Anglo-American uh, acts, but um, that there is more. Uh, mixture I within Europe um, of um, of artists, and um, this is a project that's trying to directly address this issue. So it's maybe not d the bands per se, but indirectly they benefit from um, from those kinds of projects or structures that are are being put into place and helping them to to reach new audiences, to um, to tour. Um, um, European wide um, and, and things like that and um, a lot of I think these other like ITEP um, which you probably know maybe a little bit more um, that are also trying to incorporate some more f um, educating uh, training um, on um, how do you build a European wide career and that certainly involves um, different online internet tools, how you use social media and all of those things. Yeah, I have one really concrete uh, Example, maybe f uh, from for. Um, is there anybody from a music venue here or not? Okay, yeah, you. <laughs> um, there is a music venue in the Netherlands called the P60 in Amstelveen, and they were part of this um, project called Creative Lenses, which was funded by uh, the Creative Europe program. 
And um, what they basically did was um, th that they had a really traditional way of communicating with the music fans that came to the venue, to the bands and to the artists. They just said, we have artist X at, at on day Y in, in our venue, come. And uh, they kind of found out that that model was not really working anymore. They didn't really reach the fans, the audience they were thinking they were reaching. And what they did, they were part of a project uh, with 10 other venues in 10 other cities in, the, uh, in Europe. Or, um, they uh, transformed their way of communicating with, their, with the fans and the audience of the, of the venue from a really like a transactional model. So like, hey, we, we, hit transact, we, we make a transaction of this information to, your, to the fans to a more of a dialogue model, which they are constantly talking to the to their audience on a, with, with digital means, but also invite them over in uh, uh, meetings like once or twice a year. And, uh, you know, they open up uh, backstage and uh, they do tours and all that kind of stuff. And they they build up a completely different relationship with the, with the fans and the audience of the venue. And um, with that, they have increased their turnover of, about, uh, I think, around 60 or 80,000 euros a year. Um, after two years of being part of that uh, project, which enabled them to do research on how to make the transition. And I think that's, for example, a really good way um, what Creative Europe can help with, is to create new ways of communicating with music fans or with, uh, or with the audiences. Thank you, Frank. Isabel, please, could you speak about uh, um, competitiveness and uh, diversity in music in Europe? Exist is some funds for this kind of uh, thing? Well, um, all these policies that we are talking about, they are, well, their, their objectives is actually to create a more competitive and reachable music sector in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, the tools and to, to get this point, it's the ones that we have mentioned during this panel discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, the Creative Europe identified as very important issue, for example, as we have mentioned already several times, that it's completely necessary to foster the mobility of artists and professionals because it's the way to to uh, bring your artworks to other places, that means to arrive to, to, new, uh, to reach new audiences, of course. Then the fact that, for example, uh, there are professionals here from other countries, well, then they're over there, and I don't know if they are from other ones. Uh, this is an exchange of practices. And before, you ask if uh, we are sharing the same kind of challenges. I say yes, but of course, in every country, yes, there are some, some particularities. But uh, that's why the cooperation is so important, because of course we know that uh, in the UK, for example, they are really good in audience development. Yeah. And however here, uh, we lack this kind of uh, uh, skills. So the way the, to be connected means that we can learn from them. And maybe here we are really strong, even if we don't get the support in tangible, intangible heritage, music, traditional music. Yes. We are strong on this. Maybe if we have some difficulties, so we can share our experience. But for example, with them. the politics uh, for cultural heritage here in Spain are very focused on the demand side, but not in the supply side. Mm -hmm. So this is the problem. You can offer a. Uh, um, information for the people to go to the concert, but it's important also uh, offer a good concert, a good uh, product, an interesting product for the audience. Yeah. So we have to improve the two sides of the market, no? P supply and... That's very demand. important, but I think that it's, more, it's really, really important to communicate very well uh, that you have the best concert that yeah. night in the city. Yes. And sometimes uh, in the music sector here, uh, there are 
these kind of difficulties, no? Uh, new ways to improve uh, how we reach the, the public. Yeah. And that's why uh, European cooperation is very important because in other countries, in other sectors, there are skills that they are more developed than here, and in the other sense of where we can share our knowledge in other aspects, mm -hmm. and that's uh, the, the main core of, okay. of the cooperation, actually. Okay, thank you, Isabel. Welcome. Now we have uh, 15 minutes to ask uh, the panelists if you want to, to say something or to ask something, you are invited to do it, okay? Thank you. Hello, uh, good afternoon. Um, maybe what I'm going to ask is my fault. I mean, uh, this time. <laughs> um, I, I'm working in the music industry from more than 20 years. I think that I normally know what's going on. I think I'm well informed. I think so. But I almost know about the European um, funds. Uh, about it. for Isabel, no, I met her and uh, talking with her, then I knew this, no, and maybe it's my fault that I'm not that in the, I was not informed by that, about that, but I know the rest of the, indus the un industry and my friends and look at, this hall should be full of people because we are in Spain, we need money for the music and more for the export exporting, no? But I think that I don't think it's fault of interest, but maybe it's that a lot of people don't know, or doesn't know that this is, hap is happening now in Europe. And maybe it's my fault, eh? I repeat. I'm not saying that you are not communicating, so not you, no, the, the program, no? And I also know when Spain started in the European community that a lot of funds that could be asked for they, people didn't apply because Spain is not really a um, country where we speak a very good English. We are not very used to these forms in technical and very technical English and Europe. You know, you understand me, no? And so if I, I came here to this panel <coughs> somehow waiting for a, a PowerPoint saying, you have to go to this page and the uh, uh, dates for apply are those ones. I'm going to tell you this, Herminia. Thank you very much. No? <laughs> and no, really, I, I don't know how it's working in other countries. Isabel is mm, wonderful and really professional person. But I think that there is a distance between the European politics and the the workers, no? The, um, for example, I would like to, um, to learn about um, blockchain, about internet uses, about these things, but I have to do my job, you know? I have eight hours working, my, my weekends I would like to enjoy, and I also miss this also part for the professionals to continue forming, no? But no pain with more our time or more, I, I, I don't know if I'm explaining myself properly, no, but um, if it depends on the ma managers and the people that we are in between the music, the musician and the fans, I think that we also need a little help about how to do that, no, and how to apply for that, and that's all, so. Thank you. Um, do you want me to comment on it? Because I, <laughs> I think uh, you are absolutely right. Um, coming from the music industry, uh, and I've been working in this European dimension for about six months now, <laughs> and I had to master, I had to master a language, a European uh, policy language, which is a totally different language. I think it, for me it would be easier to learn Spanish in six months than <laughs> to learn the European policy uh, language. No offense, <laughs> but, but it's, it's difficult, you know, it's, um, it's hard and I understand, uh, I think it's one of the reasons why the music sector is not connecting so well to um, uh, the Creative Europe program. Uh, and another thing is, it is indeed a lot of work and time and effort to apply. And especially if you are a small organization, you don't have that time or the money or the work. And that's why it's also really important to collaborate, to work together with, you know, with your, your, uh, your colleagues uh, on this. 
um, try to uh, and talk to people like Isabel a lot, a lot uh, because uh, that's her job. Yes, it <laughs> is. But uh, I, I really, uh, I have had some presentations in the Dutch music sector the last couple of months, and it's the exact same thing I always hear back, like. Uh, we don't. We are not aware of the program, or we read something, but we got lost in the uh, in the guidelines, or um, we they don't even think it's meant for them. And um, I think there's a big uh, role to to fulfill there. And especially since we are all working on that new Music Moves Europe program, I think one of the most important things is that we connect the program on a way that the sector understands what we what what we're trying to do. So, uh, yeah, I uh, hear you. Yeah. <laughs> so, this somehow, if it's on your hand, uh, public demand this, like, uh, um, how to do notes? Uh, uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, no. Sorry. Yes, this is our mission, actually, Armenia. Uh, <laughs> the culture office uh, of Creative Europe. And we have identified this, and we are trying because it's true. Not a lot of people in this country knows about the program. And we need to know to have a good communication strategy. To, we, we need to know where you are to go to you and tell you what opportunities the program offer. So actually our mission is informed about the program, but as well is we provide technical support, in the, meaning that we help the Spanish cultural operators that want they want to apply for some of the calls. We help them, uh, we assist them to understand all the procedure. We explain because uh, the European Commission tell us as well the priorities and everything and Fiona uh, give us uh, all the action line and uh, guidelines to do this. Um, uh, it's one of our tasks. Um, you can address to us, well, if you want later on, because we have all the information there, but we, we are there for this, uh, to answer emails, to uh, take your calls, and as well we have a, a training program. Uh, I mean, we organize info days and workshop uh, where we explain uh, the priorities of the program, um, the technical uh, details, and as well, we try to address the weakness that we have identified uh, and the reasons why sometimes the application don't succeed. And so we keep in touch. <laughs> I just want to tell you something. Um, for culture, there is not a lot of money, okay? Uh, and we have the desk helping us out, uh, disseminate and giving information, but even for them, they are limited. They are limited in numbers, so, they, so we, we, we do with what we have. Uh, unfortunately, this is, uh, this is what I can tell you. For the thing that um, everything is very uh, administrative, it is true. Uh, but if you want to have bubbling money, you have to suffer a little bit. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> Most of all, if you would like request like two million euros, Ines, which is uh, this, so this is partially funded by Ines, we give them two million euros. So uh, it's a lot of money. Uh, it, it's, uh, uh, you will see results are coming up. There is a lot of exchanges between partners. There is the, the, the festivals, these festivals are getting more and more visible, more and more international audience, more and more professionals going around. So there is an effect. Of course, the budget is limited, so we cannot do more than what we... You, you, should, you should go to new, your ministers saying we need more money for culture and then we <laughs> would have more money and <laughs> we, we could do something more. This is the solution. <laughs> <laughs> program in Spain, music pro popular program in Spain is called GPAs, it's like touring in venues, 
Um, I've been coordinating it in the last six years, and our press post at, at the beginning was one million and a half euros, and now we are in 7,000, o sea, it's the ha half, no? So, uh, if I, um, I have seen how we reduce to half our, our press post, so for sure what you are doing is so great. Because of Ines, we are doing a collaboration in Monkey Week for the last year with just one group, one of those groups that were, I work with. They come to Monkey Week to be seen by the promoters of European, no? And because this year uh, Monkey is in Ines, uh, we are having two groups. So for sure I'm seeing it, and for sure it's a great program. Please don't feel I'm saying, it's just that sometimes you are doing so many things that when you find this, Mm, it's like, oh my God, no, how I mm, Thank you. this, no? Thank you. I, I totally agree with you, Herminia. I think it's a major issue that we are facing at the moment as entrepreneurs or people that own small companies. I've seen an incredible move coming from administrations to help us because they've seen our weaknesses. But I think it's very important what Fiona is saying. If you want to apply for this, you have somehow to analyze your structure. The thing is that normally we don't have one. Many of the companies that are here are one person. So it's like, if I want to grow, if I want to apply for this funding, I need to have a minimum structure. So I have to delegate the things that are not allowing me to spend time researching for these things. So this is the, analyze, the analysis that I have done internally. Because I was exactly like you, oh my God, I missed it. <laughs> I missed it, I missed it, I missed it. And it's so, or it's becoming easier and easier. These guys are doing an amazing job. But ourselves, we have to say, if I don't have the time for this, it's because I have a problem internally. So I have to generate a minimum structure. I have to delegate all these things into somebody else so that I have time for all that. So I think we have to be a little bit um, honest and say, if I want to be there for funding, for, for work, for all the tasks that I have, I need to grow a little bit. And we need to take that risk. So this is the, we have to reach a middle ground. They are moving towards us and we have to move towards them. This is my, what I wanted to say. Yep. Okay. I would also um, suggest next to, of course, talking to the Creative Europe desk in your country. Um, also use, um, conferences or events like this to find contacts or um, others who have, who have been through this process or who are doing it at the moment. Um, you, you can learn so much uh, from them, um, how they found uh, solutions um, to deal with us where they maybe um, also ran into walls and were like, uh, should have done it completely differently. Uh, but that's that's really only how you learn. And from from my experience, um, this, this 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 community of um, of people, um, organizations who are doing these projects are really open to um, sharing their knowledge. Um, and if it just really starts out with looking up online what what kind of funded projects are at the moment, and where you see something like uh, maybe they could be an interesting contact because they're doing something similar or they, or they have a um, similar structure. Um, try to get in touch and that also really helps in, in finding ways on how to just even get the whole thing started. And this place is perfect as well to find partners for your projects because you need European partners for it. So depending on the kind of category you are applying for, so that's the place. Okay. Any question more? Okay, thank you. Uh, we don't have any time more, so it's the... Perfect. <laughs>